and welcome to our Confessions podcast, another audio array of ghastly sinfulness from the Very Bad Radio 2 listener. This week's concise collection includes a close call for Chris Evans, a fine footy fabrication, a nifty nip of nudity and a boatload of bossy big boots. Who are you going to forgive? Let us know, but here it all comes. This one comes from Mark. Dear Father Simon and the Resplendent Collective, I ask for forgiveness for a confession which occurred during a more innocent age of my life. Around the age of nine, I was informed by my mum that during the Easter school holidays, we were to leave on our first holiday to a foreign country. My grandparents on my mother's side had bought a timeshare within the Algarve in Portugal. And for a child growing up in the rougher part of South London, the chance to visit a different country was an exciting prospect, not to mention holidays with posh granny, because they were always fun. The Easter holidays eventually rolled around and we set off for the mystical lands of Portugal. As a nine-year-old, I couldn't help but be impressed. The villa we were staying in was a far shout from anything back home. The weather was amazing, the food was exciting, and the chance to go exploring around the coastline was a captivating prospect. All I knew was that if my posh grandparents went there, it must be a pretty upmarket place to be in the first place. Nearly every single member of my family are, or once were, based in education. Head teachers, Her Majesty's inspectors, many positions in between. So whenever we arrived with my grandparents, their mum and mum would spend the first evening drinking spritzers and eating small bowls of nibbles <laughs> and talking in depth about curriculum changes and problematic state funding. As you can imagine, not the most riveting conversation for a small person. So after some pretty persistent nagging, I was able to convince my mum and granny to take me down to the beach to go exploring. And that's what we did. It was late afternoon, so we took the beach walk, and I was having a fantastic time paddling, chucking rocks, and exploring the cliff edges around the beach. This is where the holiday began to take a slight turn. I had always thoroughly enjoyed a good pebble-throwing session, (laughs) mainly the heavier variety to create the biggest splash possible. I was always mindful of those around me when carrying out the activity, but the only people in sight were a couple walking slowly down the beach, who at the start were pretty far away. So I began hurling all manner of stones and pebbles, and eventually what appeared to be small boulders, splashing and creating all manner of noises as they entered the calm ocean. It actually says clam ocean. I'm imagining it's a calm ocean. You may have had had clams. Might have had clams, yeah, to be fair. Like many boys at that age, I did enjoy pushing my own limits a little bit and also the limits of how big the pebble could be and how far I could get it to go. So a new approach was necessary. I had not long ago seen on television some footage of the hammer throw and the discus and the spinning and releasing tactic appeared excellent in creating distance for a heavy object and so I began. A couple of goes provided unsuccessful and by this point, Granny and Mum were pressuring to get back to the villa. So I wound up for one final climactic throw. I grabbed a stone a bit bigger than my own hand and began frantically spinning as fast as I could. As my hand released the stone from the corner of my eye, I noticed the couple walking past me on the beach. I, at that stage of my life, had quite a ginger hue to my hair, but this man was especially red, so quite easy to spot, even at the rotating speed I was going. The stone released and my heart sank. It was travelling at exceptional speed and it seemed that the inevitable was about to happen. Stone travelled closer and closer, but then, miraculously, the red-headed man slightly bent down to look at something on the beach, and to my eternal gratitude, the large stone shot past, actually skimming his hair and making it to the sea safely. Phew! Amazingly, the man didn't even notice. It appeared I had got away with it, and I got away with not quite severely injuring another holidaymaker. Make no mistake, if it had hit him, he'd have been a goner. I then felt a tug of my arm. My mum approached and became a verbal chainsaw as she quite sensibly explained how silly it was to chuck such heavy rocks when people were around to get hit by them. This commotion caused the man and woman to turn around and my granny and mum got the biggest shock of all. Granny said, Good heavens, boy, you nearly killed Chris Evans. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, back then, I didn't know who Chris Evans was. I assumed, as he and I shared the last name and hair colour, I had inadvertently killed, nearly killed a member of our family, <laughs> who coincidentally was at the same holiday destination. You might I thought it best not to ask questions, but I did find it singly odd that we had another family member on the holiday, who not only had I nearly attacked, but we were choosing to quickly turn away from and went back to the villa. Anyway, I thought it better just to keep quiet and not to bring any more attention to myself. The holiday gradually came to an end and we began the trip back to London and normal life ensued again. 
Mum went back to work and I continued back at school. Quite soon after the holiday, though, I stayed at home due to illness and spent the day in front of the telly. To my amazement, the red-haired man, who I still believe to be a distant relative of mine, <laughs> popped up on the TV. I can't remember what show it was or what he was doing. I just felt enormous relief that I hadn't killed him. So, Father Simon and the collective, I need forgiveness for almost ending the career of the incredibly successful Radio 2 superstar. I also want to ask forgiveness for my grand and mum, who would have had to spend the rest of the holiday with blood on their hands <laughs> if the projectile had indeed made contact. To be honest, putting Chris in hospital might have taken the scene off, the, uh, really? <laughs> off our Algarve adventure. Yeah, just a bit. I'm now approaching 21 years old, says Mark, and as a student, on the days I do make it up during the breakfast show, I always count my blessings that on that day in Portugal I avoided something pretty disastrous. I've I've only been back to the Algarve once when I was 13 and I got gangrenous appendicitis and spent the whole time in hospital narrowly avoiding a pretty grisly end myself. Maybe this is karma. Yours, Mark. Well, that's a, I think that's a very good story. Nearly killing Chris Evans. That's the, uh, that's the tale. It's quite clear this was a large boulder-ish and if it had made contact, thank heavens, Chris just bent down at that last minute. Otherwise, wow. where would we Does be Chris now? Does Chris know that that happened to him? Do we know about he that? He was supposed to be on the end of, uh, uh, on the end of a phone. Uh, he why was, was he bending it. down? And and why did he bend meeting? down? To pick something up or something. Oh. Yeah. I think Chris <laughs> Evans has oh, always well, been... To be honest, we're making that bit up deadly. <laughs> oh, right. If it really matters, uh, maybe <laughs> he saw you. a pebble. Yeah, no, or I'm sure a shell. he won't remember. Maybe it was yeah. a shell for his collection. Or maybe he dropped, he dropped a... Uh, Could have done. His glasses. He's glad you don't He's glad. It. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think Chris has always been blessed with an extraordinary amount of luck. And this just proves my theory that he's a very lucky man it's in charmed, many ways. Charmed life, he's, a, he's had a charmed life. Obviously, does. it doesn't. I'm not denigrating you know, his no, no, clear no. skills because he's obviously got, you know. But anyway. Charmed. Charmed. Uh, Go on. Go on. <laughs> stop talking. Thank uh, he's not on the, the boy phone was anyway. only, The boy was only nine, and nine year olds do silly things. Yes. He didn't mean to do it. And I think he did uh, pay his uh, penance with the uh, appendicitis. I think the karma thing is completely right. So you're forgiven in my book. I just like the I, to be honest, putting Chris in hospital might have taken the sheen off the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Alan. Depends what you listen to, of course. Uh, but, yeah, I, you didn't mean to take out no. Mr Evans. In the end, there was no intention to hurt him. You very nearly got away with it. Chris would have been fine about it. In any case, and what, uh, if he'd been in your hospital, folks, with yeah, he'd have said an accident. Rock on his he head. would have said accidents happen. Oh. That's what he would have said. Uh, your folks very nearly shopped you anyway. Um, no harm done, and I, I, I agree with uh, Rebecca. The karma think justice was done in the end. Matt. Well, um, I, I, number one, this is a very good start to 2014 because that's a blinding story. Yep. Uh, and it's always nice to have a little bit of, uh, of, of celebrity involvement as well. Um, but I do get the feeling that we're being asked to forgive because he didn't kill Chris Evans. So I thank you that. for not maiming Chris Evans. And I do wonder whether if it had been another... DJ, whether we'd have been out. Thank you for not maiming Bruno Brooks, stroke Mike Smith, stroke whoever. Um, so I, for that reason, am not going to forgive. <laughs> I, for no reason at all. I don't, I don't, don't the usual the principle. The usual principle. Whatsoever. Here's tonight's tale. It comes from Liz. Thank you very much for all the new confessions coming in. Send in your brand new confession for 2014. Confessions at bbc.co.uk. Liz says, Dear Father Simon and the Forgiving Collective, there's always a lot in the media in January about the magic of the FA Cup. <laughs> and it has prompted me to make a confession which is long overdue. Do people still talk oh, about it? Yeah, 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 no, no, that's yeah. Not, I, and in fact, I recycle that story every year. So, yes, this is partly me you to recycle blame. Recycle everything. Yeah. Well, that's sport. Anyway, Liz says, My husband is a keen, or would that be fair to say, fanatical supporter of our local team who at this time were languishing in the lower echelons of English league football. Oh. We are based somewhere along the south coast. In this particular year, our team had, by some miracle, actually progressed to the fourth round of the FA Cup. We are all gathered in the lounge for the draw live on TV. My husband was keen to see a premiership site away, and, I, and a few had already come out of the hat when the ball was drawn for the next home side. Oh. Go on. Tottenham Hotspur. Wow. Excitement mounted. Naturally, Simon can understand this. Indian, I can. And then, <laughs> and then, yeah. unbelievably, our team's ball was drawn. No. Well, there was much jubilation and jumping around. Liz, Liz, we've drawn Spurs away. It's going to be fantastic. Hey, hey. 
Ah. But I replied a little tentatively, we won't beat Spurs. That's not the point. It's such a great day out. We haven't had a draw like this for years. Oh. I must get onto the club. We must get tickets now. They're going to go so quickly. Yeah. The phone started ringing with family and friends discussing the great news and making plans for the event. I carried on watching the rest of the draw and then heard that famous phrase, oh. these matches will be played over the weekend of the 26th and 27th of January. Those dates rang a bell. Oh, no. Um, what are we doing on... David, there's a problem. Oh. This isn't a dialogue, by the way. I'm <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm really into this. This is a good one. I'm loving it. You're selling this to me. You are selling this to me. It's your acting skills. They're fantastic. I've got the script here. <laughs> all right, all right. You have a blank piece of paper. I do. Well, when I, I look at you, you say Craig, Craig Level Hallwood or whatever his name is, <laughs> and then we move on. All right. Oh, is it six o'clock yet? <laughs> Those dates rang a definite bell. Uh, David, there's a problem. I said, yes. we're not going to be here that weekend. Joke. Well, there was a quizzical look. Yes. Well, that's the weekend of Jan's wedding and we're going to Edinburgh. His face dropped. Oh, no. He had some trouble computing this information. He said lamely, are you sure the wedding is that weekend? I pointed to the invite held onto the fridge by a magnet in the shape of our team mascot. He took the invite and read it through. I reminded him that we had flights booked, a hotel room reserved, a gift purchase, and a posh frock hanging in the wardrobe, newly back from the dry cleaners. Now, I will explain to the collective that Jan, getting married, was a work colleague of mine. We'd worked together for several years and formed a friendship with her and Tim, her fiancé. They had kindly invited us to their wedding, which was in Edinburgh, where Jan's parents lived. I'd assumed that David would just accept that this was a pre-existing commitment, and although it was obviously a shame to miss the football, it wasn't that, import that important. Instead, he started to cry. <laughs> no, no, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well done. Well done. Yeah. We're very sympathetic, though, don't forget. Well, I have to say, Liz, is, Liz now behaves remarkably. I suddenly realised, says Liz, how important this was to him. He was a stoic man, well used to compromising in married and family life. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen him actually physically blub, but it would have been for nothing other than serious illness or death. A decision was made at that point. He needed to see the football more than Jan needed two extra people at her wedding. We now had to work out a plan. I couldn't tell Jan that we were going to go to a football match no. instead of seeing her getting married. She certainly wouldn't understand it, so we hatched a reason to miss the nuptials. On the Thursday before the match yeah. slash wedding, yeah. I took a telephone call in the afternoon to tell me that my elderly widowed father had been taken ill and was going into his local hospital for observation. I told my colleagues, several of whom were travelling to Scotland the next day of this bad news. Obviously, obviously, I had no choice but to go and be with my dad. Everybody nodded, understood perfectly. We'd all taken the Friday off work anyway, so whilst I stayed at home, the rest of the office travelled to Edinburgh to the wedding. On the Saturday, we set off with 6,000 other loyal supporters, not my dad, obviously, to <laughs> cheer on our team. It was a big day out with singing and drinking and stories of past glories and naturally defeat at the hands of the Premiership Club. No matter it wasn't the winning or losing that counted, it was the taking part far, far more important to everybody. I had one nervous moment when we entered the stadium after a ridiculously long walk from the tube station. Let me tell you about yeah, that. Oh it's the longest dear. walk. It has it's been. so far. And saw someone who worked at the same <laughs> company as me and therefore or Jan. I quickly changed direction and he went off with his friends into another area of the ground. Very, very close. I checked the TV coverage of the game the next day. <laughs> Luckily, we were not picked out by the cameras. Phew. I went back to work on Monday, let everyone know that my dad was fortunately stable and on the road to recovery. They showed me photos of the big day. It all looked wonderful. I showed them some photos of my dad. They all said he looked better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Funny that. When Jan returned from her honeymoon, she'd almost forgotten that I hadn't been able to go to the wedding in the first place, so no real harm done. However, here's the thing. Jan and I have remained friends for many years and to this day has no idea of my oh, subterfuge sorry. and the fact that I wasn't even at her wedding. I hope that the collective can understand my need to put club and marriage before Jan's wedding. I ask forgiveness from Jan for missing her wedding and from my poor dad for his unwitting part in this deception. It's a very important match 
the fourth round of the FA Cup should you be bothered in that kind of thing or have any interest at that stage here we go Sister Rebecca then looking harsh the key thing for me here is the fact that it was a work colleague so put yourself in uh, Simon put yourself in Liz's shoes you've got tickets to go and see uh, Spurs and you've been invited to my wedding on the same weekend what would you do I'd go to see Spurs of course you would I think anyone would wouldn't they because it's a work colleague however if it was although you're a very very close work colleague yeah but if it was your friend your close friend what would you do I think that is (laughs) built I think personally there would have been more of a dilemma if it was a close friend but I think as it was a work colleague it doesn't really matter and uh, yeah Jan didn't even realise she wasn't at the wedding so it's fine Um, I wouldn't have used the father being ill excuse because I'm really superstitious about that kind of thing I think I would have come up with something else or maybe just told the truth but apart from that it's very convenient very convenient but I just don't like doing that kind of thing but uh, yeah forgiven Liz interrupting deadly it was uh, it was dad being supportive I think unwittingly admittedly and he would have approved of it anyway I'm sure but he'd be fine about it and yeah you weren't a family member so you weren't that close necessarily bit risky the TV cameras could have seen you that was a huge risk to take Uh, but no I think you are forgiven on this occasion. All uh, right, OK. Here we go. Brother Matthew. Uh, the joy of this story, really, is the husband bursting into tears. I love that because um, I, those of us who don't often uh, no. resort to tears, the, the tears is, is very much the nuclear button when everything else has failed, when there's no reasoning to be done, where basically you've lost the argument, burst into tears and win the argument automatically. I, well think, we're, I think we're intruding here into yes. some of the previous well, that's discussions. What I would do. I would absolutely burst into tears and hope hope that that works, because normally it does. Uh, so I am going to forgive, because, yeah, she didn't know you even at the wedding, and uh, and as Rebecca says, you know, work colleagues... Not, You're forgiving! Not, yeah, yeah, absolutely forgiving, yes. Well, burst into tears. Well, 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 it's the nuclear button, deadly. Come on, do it. Only to be yeah, used in extreme. You can't yes, do it can't now, because it then now. it would just appear like subterfuge. Because I don't want anything. <laughs> James has sent in tonight's tale. James, thank you very much indeed. Father Simon and your brethren of the cloth, the the events of my uh, confession take place in the reasonably recent history of August 2006. I had just arrived back from a four-month tour in Afghanistan where I had been working in the hospital in Camp Bastion as a nurse. The rest of the time, I am a male nurse in the Royal Air Force and I was at that time attached to a hospital. As is procedure when you return from an operational tour, I went to see my boss, line manager, to announce my arrival back on unit and for her, my boss, to make sure I'm well, that kind of thing. When I was in the hospital, I bumped into one of my civilian colleagues, an occupational therapist called Louise, who, after initial greetings, asked if I wanted to go out for drinks that evening as it was her leaving party. Well, after four months without alcohol, I thought this was a great idea and accepted her offer wholeheartedly. So a few hours later, I met up with Louise and her friends and had what could be described as a pretty decent night out in the borough. As I was based half an hour up the A1, Louise suggested I sleep on her sofa rather than pay for the taxi on my own. Another good suggestion made by Louise, made by Louise which I again kindly accepted. This, uh, this is a uh, friendship going on a pace, I think. Julie, a few of her housemates and I, walked back to their house and supplied with a blanket. I settled down for the night on said sofa, fully clothed and feeling a little um, tired and emotional. Did you mean Louise when you yeah, said you Julie? Did. Obviously, <laughs> obviously her real name is I'm one very of those confused. two... And we've forgotten to change one of them. What shall we call her, do you think? Let's call her Louise. Let's, yes, seems we were all used to Louise until her <laughs> real name came up. Thus, making it a waste of time to change her name. Hi. I woke up in the morning, says James. Should we stick with James? Yes. Yeah, why not? Be anything. <laughs> I woke up in the morning to the bang of the front door closing and assessed my surroundings initially a little confused. But I soon remembered the build-up to this moment. Louise, (laughs) leaving drinks, walk up the A1, sofa, yeah. But there was one noticeable difference. I was completely naked. Not a stitch on me. And my clothes were nowhere to be seen. I remember going to sleep on the sofa with my clothes on, but somewhere between then and now, my clothes had completely disappeared. They weren't even thrown across the floor. They were just completely gone. I found the blanket on the floor, so used it to protect my modesty and went searching for my clothes. Luckily, the first room I knocked on was Louise's, but she couldn't offer any suggestion this time as to where I'd lost my dignity. But a few moments later, the bedroom door swung open and in entered a very cross lady, a lady who, to my knowledge, I'd never met before. In her hand, she had a pile of clothes and they were all mine. She suggested 
Well, actually, she was quite aggressive and she threw these clothes at me and she shouted some rather rude words. She promptly turned around and left. Louise looked as confused as me, so thinking it was probably best not to ask why she had my clothes, I got dressed, had a cup of tea and left for the bus station, a little bemused and confused by the whole situation. It wasn't until several months later that I found out what actually happened that night. A very good friend of mine, another Air Force nurse... What should we call her? <laughs> Pick a name. Deirdre. Deirdre. OK, that's good. Another Air Force nurse called Deirdre was chatting to a physiotherapist in the hospital when she mentioned me in passing, at which point the physio's face dropped and in a disgusted voice said, ''You mean James? RAF nurse James?'' <laughs> Well, she was shocked by my response, by her response, and uh, truly believed that I was of good character and went on to defend me. The physio then explained how one night in August she was fast asleep in her bed. This is Deirdre, by the way. I'm so confused. <laughs> when the door to her room swung open and in stumbled a drunken man, swaying like an old oak who proceeded to remove all his clothes and get into bed with her what? and her boyfriend, then, to everyone's astonishment, suggested they all play Scrabble. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would. Yeah. Apparently my last words were, all right, then, how about Cluedo? Susan, finding this hard to believe defended me to the physio, stating that I wouldn't do such a thing. It's Susan! She... <laughs> oh, my goodness! She's in there as well. OK. She's also... In the bed. She's what? also there. What? If you're going to play Scrabble, you have to team up. So there have to be at least five or six people. <laughs> She's a new character, though, isn't she? Yeah. Susan. She's, She's not come up before. No, she hasn't. She's there. No, this is completely... Yes. This whole policy is out. <laughs> Anyway, it doesn't matter. The, the <laughs> no, fact it doesn't, is, does it? It's supremely really. irrelevant. Who's here? <laughs> yes. The point is that James... He's lost track oh, of who dear. everyone is, anyway. ...turned up, <laughs> took off his clothes and wanted to play Scrabble, and if not Scrabble, Cluedo. Cluedo. Which you would, I think. Anyway, apparently this affected their working relationship after that. Between Susan, Deirdre, <laughs> Mark, and, Bill. And, and, so they couldn't remember who <laughs> anyone was. Anyway, I'd like, Father Simon, I, this is the end of my confession, and I would therefore like to ask your forgiveness. Not, however, from the physio, uh, whose bed I tried to commandeer. I gave her a good story to tell for years to come. Uh, but I ask forgiveness because of the way my friend, whatever she's called, avidly defended my character and put her reputation on the line to defend mine when, in fact, I was just a drunken bum. Anyway, James had just come back and it was he'd been in Camp Bassey and he hadn't had a drink for four months and so he decided to, uh, to have a good time. And he had to wait a long time before actually anyone explained precisely what had happened. Uh, and it was uh, Scrabble, Cluedo and embarrassment all round. What do you say? Easily confused, Rebecca. I just don't think it was James's fault, was it? Because he uh, was asleep at the time. Well, it's no one else's and, fault. Uh, well, he was probably sleepwalking or he had a bit too much to drink. Um, he probably should have taken it a bit easy, considering he hadn't had a drink for four months. But, uh, yeah, I don't think you can blame James. I think they should have just come clean with him, Deirdre and Susan or whatever. And, much Lu earlier. and Louise. Yeah, and Louise. <laughs> they should have her. just had it all out in the she house while he was still there. Out. They're all in that house together. I, I'm going to forgive you, James. All of them. This is a den of iniquity. It is, clearly. <laughs> this is what a great story this is, uh, with, with many names. Um, four months without drink will do that to anyone, I think. Uh, well, and you, you go on your first big night out, and suddenly uh, you forget what you're doing. And what a great line that is to strip naked and find yourself in bed with two other people. And, or three, and, or four. Or four, whoever, <laughs> yes, whoever many, and suggest a, a quick game of Scrabble. Well done. I am definitely going to forgive for that. Um, I, although I think you should be asking forgiveness of the, of the good lady in the bed as well. Because I, 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 All I, of them. I'm not sure how I would respond if someone stripped off and proposed a game of Scrabble in my bed. Yeah, well, well, better than if they'd suggested Twister, I would have thought. Yes. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Right, here's tonight's tale. It comes from uh, Ian. I'm yeah, going... after last night. Could be I'm, anything. I'm concentrating. I am forward to him being called Derek halfway through this. It's from Ian, all right? Thank you. Dear Simon and the Collective, my confession has remained a closely guarded secret now for over 20 years. It happened in the early 1990s during a fantastic sailing holiday. I was lucky enough to blag my way onto a good friend's beautiful 19th century yacht. I was in my late teens and delighted to be along on one of those grown-up, expensive, beyond-my-means holidays of a lifetime, and also to be away from my parents. We sailed from Stratford Lock in County Down to Bayona in Galicia in Spain. Mm. 
Why, why do you say that? It's very nice. Mm. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, lo- yeah, it's yeah. a long way to the Bay of Biscay as well, Harry. This involved many days of sailing down the Bay of Biscay. Yes. Wow. <laughs> it continues. <laughs> and many, many hours of standing watch, steering the boat in the wee dark hours, fighting sleep, and despite the warm days, the cold nights. Watches were stood in pairs, unless, that is, you were the boat cook. This is an old tradition, that the cook does not need to stand watch. This is a major boon. As you get to sleep, read and relax as you desire, the downside of being cook is that you must, as well as preparing the three meals, make snacks, clean up and produce endless cups of tea and coffee for the hard-working crew. Did you know that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've done that very trip. I did part of Clip Around It's another ending day. We'll yeah. come back to that. So. <laughs> yeah. We'll it's come back to that. It's wise, aren't you? Later. Right. No, Lived. Neptune. After seven, we'll do that. <laughs> On this trip, the cook was called Beatty, a very confident young man, alpha male, full of wit, laughter and fun. Beatty was not vain, but took care with his appearance. And amongst a crew of blokes in T-shirts and shorts, Beatty would be resplendent in his torn jeans, white shirt open to the navel, what? silly nice. straw cowboy hat, and, most importantly, his tan cowboy boots, of which he was very proud, but which were totally ridiculous footwear on a boat. Are they allowed on a boat? They had cost more than a week's wages, he said, had heels and silver spurs. <laughs> what? He had <laughs> spurs? And studs up the side. The stitching read, ride em, cowboy. <laughs> oh, buddy. No, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> is that right? Another anecdote. His enthusiasm, though, was a constant source of fun and hilarity. This enthusiasm did not apply, however, to his culinary skills. The food started off reasonably well, meat and two veg, that kind of thing, but quickly this deteriorated into sandwiches, ham and cheese, sometimes just ham, sometimes just cheese, sometimes just bread. <laughs> Was there dressing? Was there salad? Was there any variety? I think the answer is no. Now, this trip was due to last eight weeks, and after two, we had thankfully arrived in Spain. Many, many sandwiches had been consumed at this stage, and Beatty's popularity was waning as a result of this appalling attitude towards the crew's hunger. Not only was the fare rubbish, but now no food was produced until he was shouted out of his berth and persuaded to get out his ham, cheese and stale bread. Even tea was a hassle, but at least he had his boots which he would stroke when he thought no-one was looking. <laughs> Weeks of dining out began, drinking wine, parties, singing, dancing, that kind of thing, general hilarity. Meals were supposed to be served on board too. And every time Beatty promised to leave the bar and go down to the boat to cook, he would inevitably find an excuse not to go or to vanish off to a party or some other Galician distraction like buying boot polish. By the time we had sailed back up to France... No one was in the mood to eat any kind of sandwich ever again, and Beatty was persona non grata. His sense of humour was intact, but the seeds of displeasure had long since germinated into a general grumbling about his abilities as a cook. In fact, we decided he could stand a a 4am watch like the rest of us, with his boots on or not. It all came to a head as we prepared to leave France to sail across the Channel to Falmouth. Beatty was challenged and made all sorts of promises to make amends and decided that he would spend the Channel Crossing cooking up a huge meal for us to enjoy upon arrival in Falmouth. He went shopping and came back with several petits poules. Ah, yes. (laughs) (laughs) And yes. Yeah, chicks. Small chickens. Oh, just, yeah. (laughs) I just thought you might translate Sorry, that. no, I did chicks. Yeah, small chickens Thanks. at that. Which were to be the centrepiece of his meal. The promise, however, was, as always, hollow. The little chickens languished unused in the unchilled larder. No meal was served. Beatty slept on. Talk was getting nasty, and sensing this, Beatty disappeared off to phone his girlfriend. Arriving back on board, Beatty announced that his girlfriend had actually booked him a surprise holiday as a treat and that he was getting on the first available flight home. Not only was he abandoning ship, but he was then going to go straight back to Galicia to enjoy even more fine wine and tappers. He hurriedly packed his bag, stuffing his beloved cowboy boots in, and disappeared off to make phone calls regarding trains and flights and so on. The lack of the promised chicken feast was the spur to what happened next. I went to the store cupboard, retrieved the two now mildly ripe little fowls, and carefully placed them deep inside his grip bag, in fact, right inside his stupid cowboy boots. (laughs) That'll teach him, I thought, and said no more about it to anyone. Now, I knew he had a full day's travel ahead, and I reckoned that the chickens would be fairly interesting by the time he unpacked, and this is where I need forgiveness. Beatty, on arriving home, late due to a flight delay, literally got in the door and was handed a packed bag by his girlfriend. Oh, no. He was hurried out the door to catch the flight off on his bonus holiday, his sailing bag tossed into the corner to be sorted later. 
two weeks later. Oh, dear. Two hot summer weeks with record oh, temperatures no. later. And it is for this that I require forgiveness. Not of Beatty, as he got everything he deserved, but the house was literally alive when he got home. Oh. Maggots, mice and a wall of blue bottles. Oh, dear. His precious cowboy boots, sadly destroyed... Oh. Holiday gear ruined. For this I'm not sad, but I do feel a bit bad for his poor innocent girlfriend now, his wife, who had to clean up the mess and live with the smell which apparently took months to dissipate. I prostrate myself in front of your collective judgment, and that's for me. And did you notice how everybody kept their name, their same name, throughout, throughout the entire that. story? Wow. There were only well two. Done. It was Ian and Beatty, and that's why I like, we, like keep it as straightforward as possible. Sister I picture Rebecca. Beatty as some kind of Woody Harrelson character yes. with, his, with his cowboy boots. Do you think he had a hairy chest? He probably did have a hairy chest does as it well. Matter? Not really. Actually, yes, it does. He almost certainly um, had a razor blade <laughs> on, a, on a chain, which yeah, went yeah. to sort of halfway exactly, down his chest. Exactly. Um, he's kind of annoying and not a very good chef, but, I mean, he hasn't done anything wrong. And you can't blame Beatty for saying yes when his girlfriend calls him and says, you know, come on holiday. Can Just you? cook food. You're the chef. He was going to, but then but he, he had to go and get on the train and then he had to get the plane. So I think it was a bit much to put the foul foul in his oh, well boots. Done. So, actually, Ian, I'm not going to forgive you. OK, oh. let's see what Novice Nigel makes of that. Yeah, well, I think, you know, BT, he's, he's on... And when you're on a, on a, a boat, I, part of them right around the world, yacht race, was, was that um, basically, you, you know, food's a massive factor because that's what you look forward to, doing hours of monotonous sailing on occasion. So, uh, you know, if, if your chef isn't delivering and just producing sandwiches, well, definitely not forgiven. And then, of course, the irony, that he then reneges on his grand meal of, of little chicks uh, and legs it. So, OK, it was unfortunate for two weeks of... Blottle, uh, of uh, Blue bottle growing time, but uh, definitely forgiven, Ian. Yes, absolutely. Anyone who has cowboy boots with spurs on a boat, frankly... Yeah, that's just wrong. Anything. Well, well, skippers would throw you yeah. off. They wouldn't even allow you on a boat like that. We, we, they say ride them cowboy up a side. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we've stumbled once again onto on one of my prejudices here because I have had very bad experiences with people who wear cowboy boots. They go on and on about their boots. I want to show you their boots. And I, I'm trying to show you my socks. Why am I interested in your boots? I'm not interested in your boots. And also, how did he get on the boat if he can't cook? Mm. How does he get a job as a cook if the, if the best thing he can do is cheese on toast? It doesn't make any sense. It's because he's one of these entitled cowboy boot, boy boot wearers who think, the life that owes them a living just because they've got nice boots. Well, not this time, sunshine. You came home to mice and flies. Unlucky. I'm definitely forgiving. OK. They were our confessions for this week. And we all know that you have at least one good one in you. Now is the time to send your tale. Confessions at bbc.co.uk. More exciting escapades for you next week. Don't forget to download the weekly mail while you're at it. Available now and every Thursday.